everybody and welcome to our next video here. We're going to be talking about vapor pressure and maybe you can name that song that was just playing. It seems appropriate for the topic that we're going to be discussing. So vapor pressure, although it sounds like it's going to have something to do with a gas, and I guess it does, it really is ultimately a property of a liquid. So let's take a look at what we're getting at here. So here is a closed container that has a liquid. And you know it has a liquid because the universal sign for a liquid is a wavy line here. So we're probably looking at water here because it's a blue wavy line. So that liquid at a particular temperature, some of that liquid is going to evaporate. Now, the extent to which it evaporates, of course, is going to have a lot to do with the temperature that it's at and the type of liquid that it is, and we'll get into those details later, but some of it is going to evaporate. So, some will go from the liquid phase into the gas phase, into the gas phase, and then eventually we'll have some particles up here, <clears throat> and then some of those particles will go back down into the liquid phase, and over time there's going to be an equilibrium established between uh, the liquid going into the gas phase and the gas molecules going back into the liquid phase. And when we get to that point, when we get to that equilibrium point, then we can go ahead and measure the pressure that the liquid creates by evaporating some of its molecules into the gas phase to create a gaseous pressure. That's going to be our vapor pressure of a liquid. So that's what we're getting at. We're getting at ultimately a property of a liquid by way of measuring how much of it can turn into a gas. Now let's just think about some hopefully fairly commonsensical ideas here. So evaporation or vaporization, whatever you want to call it, that process itself, is that exo or endothermic? Think about it for a second. Is vaporization exo or endothermic? And remember, we're in chemistry, so get your sign conventions correct. Think about it. Evaporation is endothermic, right? You need to put heat into the system to get the molecules to want to turn into a gas, to go from the liquid to the gas phase. So this is endothermic, so we're looking at a positive delta H for, um, for this sign. Now, why is it endothermic? Well, we've alluded to this throughout class and uh, many of the video lectures up to this point, but when a material, when a liquid evaporates, what it's doing is it's removing whatever intermolecular forces were theoretically there to begin with. So the fundamental difference between a liquid and a gas in terms of the ideas we're talking about in this unit, is the presence or non-presence of intermolecular forces. Remember, theoretically, a gas, according to the kinetic molecular theory, there are no interparticle forces between the different atoms or molecules or whatever it is we're talking about. So a liquid to gas transition gets rid of the intermolecular forces. And so what we'd be talking about here is we're talking about the idea of the heat of vaporization, which I know you've experienced before. You've bumped into, I think, in physics class, um, and you've probably seen in other chemistry classes. For water, do you remember what the heat of vaporization is for water? Do you remember that value? Maybe you do. Well, I'll tell you that it is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. We're going to come back to that number uh, later on in this unit, but try to remember that. So you get water to the boiling point temperature, and then it's going to need an additional about 41 kilojoules of energy to get from the liquid phase into the gas phase, because buried inside of that 40-odd kilojoules are things like hydrogen bonding, the LDF that's there, the dipole-dipole interactions, all of those various IMFs that might be present for water, they account for about 40 or so kilojoules worth of energy, and we have to get rid of that amount of energy if we are to go ahead and complete the phase change. All right, I'm going to get this stuff out of the way, and we're going to go ahead and take a look at a graph. So, with the, with the idealized picture up here in mind, let's pretend like we have only liquid molecules in our closed container up here to start with. Only liquid 
molecules, okay? So then the question becomes, we're going to put in a couple of rates here. What happens to evaporation uh, over the course of time for that closed container with just a liquid? And I'll put evaporation in red. Initially, right, for the rate of evaporation, it starts off that um, the, the molecules are going to evaporate with a certain rate, okay? It's going to be dependent upon things like the temperature that this container is at and I suppose the surface area that the liquid has access to. So the rate of evaporation, which I'll do in red, is really going to be a constant, okay? It's going to be some constant rate that's hopefully uh, a straight line. So that's the rate of evaporation. Now, how about the rate of condensation? And I'll do this in blue. The rate of condensation. So initially in our idealized container, we don't have any vapor molecules. So the initial rate of uh, condensation is going to be down here at zero. And then over time it's going to grow in. So we'd have a shape that looks a lot like the curves for rates that we saw back in the kinetics unit. We're going to have a shape that looks kind of like that. And hopefully you see what I'm getting at here. What's going on as we progress out to this part? So C here was the rate of condensation. So what's going on out here, right? We see that the rates of evaporation and condensation are equal to each other, okay? And so when we have rates of opposing processes being equal to each other, what do we call that in chemistry? Hopefully you're saying, Dr. Crane, we call that equilibrium, right? That's what's going on out here. So vapor pressure, I want to get this point across, vapor pressure is a measurement that you can only take once the system reaches equilibrium. So you have to wait around as long as you need to until the rate of evaporation and condensation in my closed container there are equal to each other. Then we can go ahead and measure the vapor pressure that that liquid possesses. Now, how do we measure vapor pressure? Well, I'm going to show you a quick little cartoon about how we would do this, and it involves this instrument here. Now, this instrument contains a pool of mercury down here. That's why I used the gray color, because mercury is kind of, you know, grayish, silver, whatever you want to call it. So I've got a pool of mercury down here, and then a long tube, and that mercury rises up inside that long tube to get to a particular height. Do you remember the name of this instrument here, something that can be used to measure pressures that has this particular shape? Do you remember that? It's a barometer, right? That's called a barometer. So we can use barometers to measure pressures. Now, if my barometer is not exposed to any particular liquid, okay, it's really essentially um, at, uh, at sea level at one ATM and I don't have any um, particular liquids uh, involved in the system, hopefully we remember that the height of that mercury level there at one ATM is going to be 760 millimeters worth of mercury, right? That's standard uh, pressure in millimeters of mercury, one ATM. Now, how do we use this device then to measure the vapor pressure of a liquid? Well, what we need to do is we need to expose the barometer to a equilibrium um, pressure of that liquid. So maybe what we do is we introduce something like some water into the system. And what's going to happen is that water will travel up the tube there. Some of it will get to the top and it will evaporate. And that's going to create a pressure inside the top of the barometer. That pressure will cause the level of the mercury to go down, right? That's going to be a pressure that's going to push out some of the mercury. And for water at uh, room temperature, or let's just say 25 degrees Celsius or so, the height that the uh, water ultimately achieves is only going to be, what do I have here? I have uh, 736, okay, for water, okay? The uh, 25 degrees, that's going to push out enough of the mercury so that the height of the column is now 736. So that means then, by difference, 760 minus 736, we get a value of about 24. So that's the vapor pressure of the water at 25 degrees, okay? It has a vapor pressure of 24 millimeters of mercury. 
and we can introduce other liquids into the container. For example, if we uh, introduced ethanol, ethanol has a formula of C2H5OH, that's ethanol. Ethanol, if we introduced it to our barometer, would ultimately have a vapor pressure of about 65 millimeters of mercury. So it would be noticeably taller than what I'm showing here for the water. And then something like uh, diethyl ether, um, the structure of which maybe we'll get into uh, in class, its vapor pressure is even higher still. Its vapor pressure is about 545 torr. So what we see is different liquids will have different vapor pressures as measured through our barometer set up here. And we're going to talk about that in the next video. Why do different liquids have different vapor pressures? Hopefully you already know the answer to that. And we're going to get into more uh, descriptions of how we do these measurements and how we can do these comparisons of these vapor pressures at different temperatures. But the uh, takeaway here for this video is the definition of vapor pressure. Okay, it's the pressure above a liquid at a given temperature once the liquid and the vapor have achieved, achieved equilibrium, and that we can measure vapor pressure with get-ups like this barometer. We'll get more into those measurements in the next video. All right, uh, for now, why don't we leave with a little bit of the music we came in with. <laughs>